Gabriel would have told us that this was not an easy task for this baby announcing business was more than a notion. He had done it in the Old Testament and even in twice in the same year, he had announced to a woman that she was going to conceive a child. First episode in this particular year didn't go so well. Zachariah, the father, asked the question, I'm too old, I'm, and, and my wife Elizabeth is too old also. It's impossible what you're talking about. And I can only imagine Gabriel was saying, how's it going to work this time? It didn't go too well. Zachariah could not speak for several months. And only when the baby John was born, did he open his mouth and exclaim the good news that he had seen and heard in the temple? How is it going to go this time? and mighty and glorious God. We come this morning with thanksgiving in our hearts. We come, oh God, in this season of expectation and waiting, and we are excited about what's about to happen in this life. God, we look to you, and we are filled with awe and all that you have already done for us and we thank you God that you've given us an opportunity one more time to come together to praise your matchless and glorious name you are in fact Emmanuel God with us and because you are with us we need not fear anything oh God and we raise you up this morning we bless your name we thank you, we praise you, we worship you with all that is within us. And we thank you for the opportunity of worship. Oh God, be with us in this moment. We welcome your presence in this place. We live through your spirit. We have our being in you. And so if you don't come, oh God, if you don't 
manifest yourself today, Lord. We won't be able to praise you like we ought. The choir won't be able to sing God like they should. The ushers won't be able to greet like they ought. We won't be able to fellowship and the preacher won't be able to preach God. But if you come, if you are here, if you manifest yourself as you already have in this place, God, then all shall be well. Everything will be well. Every kind of thing will be well. And we shall see it. So come, Lord Jesus. Come while we are waiting. Come and be praised. Come and be worshipped. Come. Come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning is Advent, or we continue in Advent. And Advent means coming or arrival. During this season, we celebrate Christ coming into the world and watch with expectant hope for his coming again. These four weeks of Advent present an opportunity for communal discernment and for personal examination as the church prepares to celebrate the birth of our Lord. This then is a season of holy waiting. As we light the candles of Advent, we wait. We wait with hope and expectation of the coming of the Savior and the hope of Christ's return. We light the candle of peace and we wait with longing for a day when we shall study war no more and that peace will indeed reign. And we light the candle of joy, and we wait with the joy of Jesus in our heart. With childlike anticipation, we light the Advent candles as we wait. Together we sing this morning our hymn of worship, O Come, I'm sorry, I said the wrong thing. Love divine, love excelling. You'll find the words on the screen behind me. Let us sing to the glory of God.
Amen. Our scripture for this morning is hymn 90, Psalm 90. Psalm 90, starting at verse 13 and concluding at verse 17. You'll find it on the screens, in the pew Bibles, as well as the Bibles that you have brought with you. Amen. amen. When you found it, please say amen. amen. Let us read together. Turn, O oh Lord, how long? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, so that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad as many days as we have afflicted us, and as many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be manifest to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and prosper for us the work of your hands. Oh, prosper the work of our hands. Amen.
put it together. Are y'all ready to put it together? How many come to praise the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? Uh, he's with us. I don't know about you, but I brought him to church with me this morning. Isn't that right? Y'all ready to put it together? I want everybody to come on and blow the roof off. And come on, give God some praise. Here we go. One, two, three. testimony this morning that you came to worship. Oh, you can do better than that for a God who came from glory just to be born so he can be with us. Amen. Can we just give God just a few seconds of praise and worship this morning? I don't know about you, but I'm so glad that Christmas, this season is a reminder that God is with us. I don't know about you, but I need him to be with me on this morning. So I came to scream out Emmanuel and, and to let God know that I adore him this morning. Can we just sing that one more time? Can you sing with us Emmanuel? usher and give God praise. He comes to sit in our midst. And I don't know about you, but I want God in, in the midst of my worship, in the midst of my praise. Amen. Anybody feel like worshiping God this morning? I know I'm here to do the welcome, but I just can't help myself. I need to prepare an atmosphere. I need a word this morning. Did we have any worshipers in the house this morning? Anybody coming expecting something from the Lord this morning? This is the season of expectation. But in order to get what God has for us, we got to create an atmosphere so he can, we can feel his presence with us. So I didn't come to sit on a pew or sit on a pulpit. I came to wave my hand. I came to open my mouth and let the Lord know that I adore him on today. Do we have just maybe two more seconds for a little bit of praise right now? Anybody else want to get in on it and sing Emmanuel that God is with us so God can sit in our midst and do a work that he wants to do this morning? Don't hold your praise back from the Lord. We ought to glorify him. We ought to magnify him. Let us sing out Emmanuel. Oh, I can't sing, but open your mouth. Let us sing Emmanuel. Hey, hey. Emmanuel. We worship you. I'm going to get on to welcome in the We worship you. I am going to get on to welcoming the visitors, but can we say, we worship you. Can you open your mouth and let the Lord know that you came to Hallelujah in this place today. We worship you. Amen, 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 amen. Well, I want to make sure that 
Everyone in God's house feels welcome at this moment. And so we're going to ask if we have any first-time visitors visiting with us this morning. If you're visiting Mount Olive for the first time, can you stand to your feet? Any first-time visitors? Amen. <laughs> Praise God. We thank God for our sister who is worshiping with us on behalf of our pastor, the Reverend Dr. James E. Victor Jr. We want to extend a heartfelt welcome to you this morning, and we also want to extend that welcome to our online worshiping community who, who are um, worshiping with us via the internet. And we want you to feel free to worship God how you see fit, amen? We don't want you to hold your praise back. We want you to join with us in giving God the best praise we know how. So free yourself, run around if you need to, but know that we are glad that you are here worshiping with us. We're glad that the online community is here and the ushers have given you a, a survey and there's also a survey online for everyone to fill out. We want to know how we can serve you better. So if you will fill that survey out and hand it to an usher on your way out, we will be so appreciative of it as, as you will do the same online. We will be grateful because we just want to be a better church. Amen. And so if you can fill those surveys out and help us to be a blessing, not just to this church, but to this community. Amen. Amen. Well, we want to make sure not only our visitors feel welcome, but that everybody feels welcome this morning. So we're asking everyone to stand up, give your neighbor a glad handshake or a holy hug this morning, and make sure to give our visitors an extra hug on today. Amen. Praise God. This season is about a God who has come near us. And the least that we could do and the most that we ought to do is worship him. Let me try that again. The least we ought to do and the most that we should do is worship him. I, I don't think y'all feeling me. When you understand who God is, as Otto says, the mysterious tremendum and the mysterious transcendent that God has come near. That means whatever mess you got, God is in it. Y'all ain't feeling me. Whatever mess you got, God has come into it. Whatever sickness you got, he's in it. Whatever unemployment you got, he's in it. Whatever trouble you got, he's in it. Whatever racial discord we got, he's in it. But here's the secret. God can't stay in anything too long without changing it. Come on now, yes. All right, I'm going to preach by myself. So then when we say Emmanuel, it's not an abstract concept. It's an existential reality that God has come into my mess and is going to transform it, turn it around, change it. And if he doesn't change it, he's going to change me. So then the least I could do and the most I ought to do is just worship him who's in my mess. All right. Y'all ain't feeling me. Maybe the next song will get you over the hurdle. Come, ushers, let us worship now in giving. We give not because we need to get something, but we give because we have already received the blessings of the Lord. So let us be generous. Let us be faithful. Let us be uh, honorable in our giving. Because the Bible says that when we fail to give the tithe, we have, in essence, committed theft against the eternal. Will a man or woman rob God? How have you robbed me in tithe and offering? I don't want to be guilty of robbery. I don't want to be convicted of theft when God has been so good and so gracious. So let us give now generously. Let us pray. We bless your name today, God. We just thank you for being who you are. You are God and there's none like you. As we prepare to return back to you a portion of 
what you have blessed us with, we ask, Father, that you continue to multiply every one of them, that they may be used for the upbuilding of your kingdom here on earth. We thank you, God, for this opportunity. We ask now, oh, Father, that you forgive us for wherever we've sinned and fallen short and done and said things that have been displeasing in your sight. We thank you, and we will continue to lift up your name, for you are Emmanuel. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. to be a blessing to our brothers and sisters who are suffering still in South Carolina trying to recover from floods that occurred all the way back in October. I know it's Christmas, but I also, and I know money is tight. Lord knows money is tight. I just finished all of my Christmas shopping a few weeks ago. Money is tight. But I also know that when you give to help someone else, God always sends it back blessed and multiplied. So if you will consider today as our ushers come for a second offering, which will be exclusively used to help our brothers and sisters in South Carolina. We in partnership, that is PNBC in partnership with Lot Carey and the National Baptist Convention of America, are going to be establishing resurrection centers there in the state of South Carolina to aid individuals get back on their feet and recover from such devastating floods. I didn't have my money last week, but I got it this week. I'm going to trust God that this $100 I give is going to come back in some way or another, and I'm counting on God to multiply it because tuition is due in January. But I'm trusting God that if I give today to help somebody as I pass along, then my living and my giving will not be in vain. So let us give to help our brothers and sisters all that we give in this second offering, which is above and beyond our tithing offering, will be used as our contribution for our convention work in missions. Amen. Let us just pray and thank God for what we are going to receive on behalf of our brothers and sisters. Eternal thou, we are grateful for the privilege of giving. And we are thankful, God, that we have something to give. It may not be as much as someone else's, but Lord, we give what we give, and we give according to the means and the measures in which you have already blessed us. So take now our gifts, receive them for the purpose of blessing others. And in doing so, dear God, return to your children according to their faith in you as they have given sacrificially and above and beyond that which you require of us. Thank you now for a true love gift to help our brothers and sisters in South Carolina. It is in the name of your greatest gift which comes to us and we celebrate it in this season of Christmas. Jesus the Christ. It's in his name that we pray. God's people said together, amen. I was sinking deep in sin Far from the peaceful shore Very deeply stained within Singing right no more But the master of the sea Heard my despair From the waters, he lifted me up now, safe and I.
Can we say it one more time? That your baby boy would one day walk on water. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would save our sons and daughters? Did you know that your baby boy has come to make you new? This child that you delivered will soon deliver. your baby boy would give sight to you, the blind man. Mary, did you know that your baby boy will calm the storm with his hand? Did you know that your baby boy has walked where angels tried. When you kiss your little baby, you kiss the face of God. Mary, did you know the blind will see the death will hear, the dead will live again. The lame will leap, the dumb will speak, the praises of the lamb. The lamb, hey Mary, did that your baby boy was Lord of all the creation. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would one day rule the nation? Did you know that your baby boy is heaven's Perfect lamb, the sleeping child 
you're holding is the grave the great about you that's beyond description and beyond explanation. We just thank you that you are a transcendent God, but yet a God who is near. So God, you manifest yourself in ordinary things in extraordinary ways. In an ordinary birth, there's an extraordinary child. Could any of us have known? Could any of us know now? So God, reveal yourself to us. Raise the dead. Open blinded eyes. Calm storms with your nail-scarred hands. Pierce the dense barriers to remembrance through experience on a daily basis. Now, O oh God, let us hear your word. Speak to us, God. These are troubling times. Once again, another brother has been needlessly shot by police. These are troubling times. Anti-Muslim rhetoric has seemed to become normative in a country that is supposed to be hospitable and uses as its mantra, give us your tired, your poor, your huddled masses. These are troubling times when extremists in both Islam and Christianity are allowed to say what they say and exercise their freedom, but never is the voice of reason truly heard. So God, speak to us and embolden us with your word. Now, God, whatever you need to do, we're open for you to do it. And do what only you can do. Bless your people. And we'll give you all the praise, the honor that is due to the grandeur of your name. We ask these blessings of enablement and empowerment in the name of your son, Jesus the Christ. 
that little baby in a manger who is still king at his birth. It's in that name that we pray. Amen. Beloved, I'm still wrestling with Mary, and so our text has not changed much significantly since last week. Once again, we look to the first chapter of the Gospel according to Luke, and the printed text says that we'll end at verse 33, but just indulge me to read till 38. Let us stand, all those who can and will, to give reverence to the word of God. The text reads, In the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. Thus ends the reading of the word. Amen. I just want to talk for a little while from the subject, favor sure ain't fair. Favor sure ain't fair. Beloved, I must give a confession this morning. When reading these kinds of texts, I'm always amazed at what's not said as to what we can, or in addition to what we read and see in the text. There's always a backstory. There are always elements that are hinted at but not overtly expressed or explained. And so when I read these kinds of stories, I'm always amazed at what's really going on. And in this passage, I wish I could be a fly on the wall the day that God told Gabriel to go tell Mary she was going to conceive. Gabriel would have told us that this was not an easy task for this baby announcing business was more than a notion. He had done it in the Old Testament and even in twice in the same year, he had announced to a woman that she was going to conceive a child. First episode in this particular year didn't go so well. Zachariah, the father, asked the question, I'm too old, I'm, and, and my wife Elizabeth is too old also. It's impossible what you're talking about. And I can only imagine Gabriel was saying, how's it going to work this time? <laughs> it didn't go too well. Zachariah could not speak for several months. And only when the baby John was born did he open his mouth and exclaim the good news that he had seen and heard in the temple. How is it going to go this time, boy, would I love to be a fly on the wall. How's it going to go this time? So he does 
what he is dispatched to do. He finds the Virgin Mary and tells her that she is going to conceive a child. They shall call his name Jesus. And the Holy Spirit will overshadow her and the child that is to be born will be holy. Boy, what a tough word to a woman who has no experience. And then there is Mary who comes to hear the greeting of an angel. Greetings, favored one. Favored one. What could this mean? Favored one. Yes, you have found favor in the sight of the Lord, says Gabriel. Favor. You are going to conceive a child. Favor. Beloved, favor is one of those words that we bandy about in the church these days with little understanding of what it really means. We look at favor as if it is some preferred position that God has bestowed upon his own. And it is to the exclusion of others leaving us with some limited notion of favor as if I'm favored and nobody else is. If I were to apply modern day notions of favor, I could rib you for last week's football game. The Cowboys got favor. Redskins got nothing. <laughs> but that's how we view favor. I got blessed, nobody else did. And so when I go in and I get a good parking spot in the mall, I got parking favor. You just got there at the right time. God didn't have nothing to do with you getting a parking spot. But we look at such trivial advantages as the favor of God. But you see, beloved, and then we go around talking about favor ain't fair. I got mine, but you didn't get anything. As if I'm some privileged class of individual and that I've done something unique or special to merit, to earn, to deserve the favor of a living God. But I'm here to tell you that when you look at this text, favor, sure enough, ain't fair. Because with favor come some burdens. And beloved, you need to understand that with every blessing of God, there is some burden. We, we often want blessings without any down payments on eternity. We want God's favor. We want God's riches. We want God's blessings. We want God's uh, uh, predetermined outcomes. But seldom do we want the work inherent in the blessing or the responsibility that comes with being blessed. No, favor ain't fair. Look at this text for what it says, but for what it doesn't say. Mary, you're favored. Really? I'm going to have a son. Yeah, but I got a husband or a fiance, and we've not yet consummated our relationship. You're favored. Now, every time you walk down the street, the sisters are going to whisper, there goes that little fill in the blank. <laughs> and nine months of waddling, 
morning sickness, throwing up, the discomfiture of a creature growing deep inside of you, favor sure ain't fair. Now she's got a fiancé that even though he has been assured by another angel has a distrust and a ruptured relationship, a community that looks at her askew. Baby, when you're favored, favor sure ain't fair. But let me tell you this. Favor has within it an inherent struggle. But it is the struggle that is a part of the blessing. And whenever you begin to want blessings without struggle, you really want God to do something for you that you have to learn to do for yourself. And too many of us want God to do everything for us without taking any responsibility for ourselves. And so we pray for a job, never click one page on the internet to look for a job. Never pick up the paper to look for a job. Never uh, create a resume. We want relationships, good relationships. But never do we really invest the time, the energy for healthy, positive relationships. We just want God to rain down blessings from above. And inherent in the favor is the struggle. We are like Frederick Douglass made note of many years ago, those who favor freedom and yet despise agitation are people who want rain without thunder and lightning or want water, or want the oceans without their, the mighty roar of their waters. They want crops without plowing. We have come now to a time in which we, we feel so entitled. Favor is what we seek from God. But you need to know, baby, favor show sure ain't fair. There's going to be some struggle in the favor. There's going to be some scandal in the favor. There's going to be some tears in the favor. There's going to be some muscle building in the favor. There's going to be some strengthening in the favor. Mary, you are blessed and highly favored, as the old King James says. But I want you to also see that in the struggle, in the favor, there's also the favor eventuates into a seemingly possible assignment. Favor brings with it an assignment. Mary, you shall bring forth a son. You're going to do something. God has selected you for an assignment. And beloved, when we look at ourselves, the question becomes, are we assignment worthy? Are we assignment ready? Are you ready for the gift of an assignment that God is ready and willing to give you now? Because of favor. Most of us are not ready. And so we get stuck and always cry, the same old song, pray the same old prayer, longing for the same old things. And it's not that God is not willing or ready or able to bless us. The question is, are we ready for the assignment? The assignment boggles the mind because the assignment is always greater than our present capacity. And an assignment from God that's not bigger than what you are able to do is not an assignment that you really ought to be invested in. God's assignments stretch you. God's assignments enlarge you. 
God's assignments make you bigger and better. How can this thing be when I don't know a man? I don't have the capacity right now. But let me tell you that if you understand the God who gives an assignment, God knows how to bring things into existence that we don't think we have the capabilities of doing. And if anybody ever looks back on your life, you'll discover that you got some favor and some blessing that you didn't think you could do, but God did it. You're living in houses now that you didn't have down payments for, but God did it. You got jobs now that you didn't qualify for, but God did it. It wasn't because you were so special. It was because you had a special God. And where you are now is a duty station. Because God has you there to be a witness for him. Many of us bemoan our present locations. But the question is, have you done what God asked you to do where you are? Have you witnessed? Have you lived as a light before people who find themselves in darkness? Have you lived as, the, as a Christian ought so that someone would dare look at you and say, Sir or madam, we would see Jesus. That's what favor is. It's about giving you an assignment that's bigger than what your present capacities and abilities and experiences are. But here's the, 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 the good news. What you think is inconceivable has a name. You don't think you can have a baby, but his name is Jesus. Walk with me here. I'm going somewhere. Because when you think it's inconceivable, it's impractical, it's beyond possibility, but when you name something, it makes it real. And when you can name it before it takes place, then it helps you to move from the impossible to the actual, from the inconceivable to a new reality. And baby, every now and then, you ought to name your assignment, name your dreams, name your ambitions, name where God wants you to go. I'm going somewhere, but the somewhere's got a name. Can I help you? I'm not just graduating. I'm graduating magna cum laude. See, and that helps you to realize and live into all of your study. I'm not just getting a job. I'm getting a G15. See, you got to name what God is doing. It shall be called Jesus. And when the inconceivable has a name, it's already on the way. It might take a period of gestation. It might take labor. But if God named it, it's on its way. You got to learn the name of what God is doing. The inconceivable has a legitimate name. You shall call him Jesus, and he will be the son of the most high, and he shall reign on with his people, and there shall be no end to his kingdom. There's something peculiar about naming your dreams, naming your assignments, and until you can name it, you're always left to waddle in the confusion of unrealized hopes and aspirations. Name it. I didn't say claim it, I said name it. Don't get it twisted. 
because you don't have to claim what the Lord has already decreed. All you got to do is name it and then live into it. Name it and become that. That's why it's important what you name your realities. Because whatever you name it is what it's going to be. If you name a child some off-the-wall kind of name, <laughs> that's what he or she is going to be. If you name your relationships as doomed and filled with gloom, that's what they're going to be. If you name your church as something that is unfulfilling and unsatisfying and ungratifying, that's what it's going to be. But if you can give it a lofty name, then you've got something to live up to and live into. And that will always stretch you beyond your present capacity. Too many of us are grappling with worthless dreams and ambitions because they're really too small. Where are the big dreamers? Where are those that can articulate grandiose visions for themselves? If you think small, you're going to be small. If you don't have greatness within you, then you're always going to be a minor league player. Think big. Grow big. Think big. Be big. Marry your favorite. A little girl in a fishing village on the outskirts of Podunk. And yet, you shall be the mother of Christ. Thank God that God's plans for our lives are not contingent upon our present predicaments. That God can take you from the middle of nowhere and enlarge you wherever you might be. Favor is not fair. It has struggle in it. It has some tears and heartbreak and shedding of, of, of briny tears and struggle in midnight hours, but it's always worth it. Even though favor also frightens. The angel had to tell her, Mary, don't be afraid, which means that Mary was afraid. Don't be afraid, for the Lord is with you. And you see, beloved, when we are open to God, we begin to think about possibilities. But when we're closed to God, we begin to doubt opportunities. Now, if you were to push this text back, Zechariah asked a similar question. Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, serving in the temple on his day, on his appointed day, and Gabriel stands before him and tells him that his old barren wife is going to bear a child. And Zechariah, because he's not open to God, doubts God's opportunity. But Mary says to Gabriel, how can this be? She is basically saying, because I'm open what are the means by which God is going to do this great thing? And you see, beloved, 
when we're open to God, it leads us to a path of discovery. Too many of us are so settled with where we are, what we've done, what we've already accomplished, that we're not thinking about what can be. Just because you reach a level of maturity doesn't mean that God is finished with you. Let me put it another way. Just because you get old doesn't mean that God is finished with you. Every day, regardless of your age, you ought to be looking and open to God and asking God, how can what you have said in my life come to pass? I don't have money. How can it come to pass? I don't have necessarily the agency, but how can it come to pass? I may not have the educational background of somebody else, but how can it come to pass? I may not have the networks, but how can this be? And it leads to a path of discovery. Are you willing to walk with the journey? Are you willing to walk with God on this journey to find out where it's going to lead? Our old folks used to say it this way, I'm going to run on and see what the end is going to be. I don't know every nook, every turn, every cranny. I don't know every detour. But as long as Jesus is on the journey, I'm willing to go all of the way. I'm willing to, to forge ahead and take some risk. I'm willing to commit and make self-sacrifices. I'm willing to go and see where God is going to lead. Because my, my ultimate reality has already been named. Beloved, you got to go on the journey in order to get where God wants you to go. You can't stay stuck. You cannot rest on your laurels, past accomplishments. Don't be afraid because favor ultimately means God is with you. That's what favor really means. God is with you. Favor is not merely the blessing, but it is the blessor. It's not merely the gift, but it's the giver. Real favor is not just what you get, but who gave it to you. So don't just look at your blessings and favor as I got something from God, as if God is some proverbial Santa Claus that will drop down on a special day and give you whatever you ask as you sit on his lap in prayer. No, God is much more than that because the ultimate symbol of favor is that the Lord will walk with you and talk with you and guide you and govern you and sustain you and be with you. So it's not about what you get. It's about who gave it. That's what real favor is. Because what I have come to understand in a life of living, that when some things else go, God is still there. When, when I lose some things on the journey, God is still there. When I lose my youthfulness, God is still on the journey. When I lose a little bit of money, God is still on the journey. When I lose some friends, God is still on the journey. When I lose a job here or there, God is still on the journey. And the same God that blessed me with this friend is, a, is the same God that can send some new friends. The same God that gave me this job is the same God that can give me another job. 
The same God that blessed me with health is the same God that can restore me in my sickness when all else leaves. I've got Jesus, and that's all that really matters, beloved. As long as I got Jesus, I got enough. As long as I got the Lord on my side, I've got enough. You can take this world's riches, but give me Jesus. You can take power and prestige, but give me Jesus. You can take silver and gold, but give me Jesus. And as long as I got Jesus, I've got enough because I'm faith with God. God is with you. That's the real faith. Not the stuff, but the source. Not the blessing, but the bless all. And what I have discovered that, that the blessing, the favor is an extension of the blesser. But it doesn't encapsulate the totality of the blesser. Y'all not feeling me. In other words, what I got, what I'm gifted with, what God bequeaths to me is an extension of God. But it ain't God. Because God is more than the gift. Y'all ain't feeling me. I said he's more than the gift. He can give me joy, but he is my joy. He can give me strength, but he is my strength. He can give me power, but he really is my power. For the joy of the Lord is my strength. Take this world, but give me. Jesus. Favor, I tell you, sure ain't fair. There's some scandal in it, some hardship in it, some intrinsic and inherent work, but it's worth it because God is with us. Don't ever confuse the gift with the giver. For the gift is but a mere extension of the giver. There may be somebody here today that has been favored. There's an assignment that God has laid on your heart. And you need to fulfill it. You've been procrastinating. You've been lingering. You've been languishing. You've been pouting. Or you've been stuck in some pity party because things are not ideal. But God has a plan for your existence, a calling on your life, a gift to your being. And he's with you to bring it to pass. It's already been named. So live in it. Walk into it. Discover it from a course of discovery. If there's someone here today that feels as if you've been found, as if a lost soul has been discovered by God, and now there's new purpose and existence and meaning to life, we invite you to come. This is your opportunity to come to God and be made whole. Mary said, may it be to me as you have said it to be. And then the text says something strange. And Gabriel departed and I can imagine Gabriel went back to the throne and told God, she said yes. She said yes 
She's open to new possibilities for her life and for her energies to be engaged in the divine decree that you have spoken into her existence. She said, yes. And now, do what you do, God. If there's somebody that can say yes to favor, we invite you to come. To have a relationship with the personification of God with us in the person of Jesus Christ. Or if you're looking for a church home, we encourage you to come by letter or by Christian experience. What is most important is not how you come, but that you come. And that you yield yourself to the divine. As the choir sings, we extend the invitation to Christian discipleship.